Hi, I'm Tracy, VE3TWM. Thank you for tuning in to Outdoors on the Air. In the years prior to becoming a licensed radio amateur, I spent many happy hours shortwave listening. As I'm sure most of you are aware, there are some fascinating radio transmissions on the HF spectrum away from the ham bands. I haven't done much shortwave listening in the recent past, preferring to spend my precious radio time partaking in ham radio related activities. But occasionally I consider the importance of being able to monitor non-ham HF radio. After all, we've got radios that are really good at general coverage HF reception. But just as on the ham bands, the antenna is where the real strength of a radio system resides. When I first started using EndFed antennas for my ham radio pursuits, I used a brand called EndFeds, made by Par Electronics. After several years of great success, along with growing a passionate customer following, Par sold the rights to the EndFeds line to LNR Precision. I see now that LNR has transferred the EndFeds business to Vibroplex. I'm talking to you about the EndFeds line since they offer a product called the EFSWL. Unlike all their other models, the EFSWL is a receive-only antenna. The manufacturer states plainly that attempting to transmit with this antenna will damage the matching unit. Regardless, you'll find many extremely positive reviews on the eHAM site for the EFSWL. It seems to be an excellent choice for those that want to monitor all HF general coverage frequencies. I've often wondered if the performance of the EFSWL would be such that it would be worth having in addition to a ham bands only antenna. Last month I found a used EFSWL for sale second hand on the table at a recent ham radio swap meet. The antenna was in good condition at a fair price, so I purchased it. I was finally equipped to put it to the test. Is it worth the effort to buy an SWL receive-only antenna and deploy it at your ham shack as a second antenna? Can it provide enough of a boost on the general coverage bands to warrant the expense and effort? Let's find out. Before we get started though, I will let you know that I experienced a technical issue while recording this video. My goal was to go to a local conservation area to shoot. I set out at 8 a.m. on a frigid Saturday morning with my good friend Randy, VE3 OZR. Five hours and a lot of work later, we were back at my place. When I downloaded the footage to my computer, I discovered that while the video was fine, there was no audio due to an issue with my external microphone. The choice was clear. Either present the information collected with a series of still images, or throw away hours of effort and wait weeks or months for another chance to redo the test. I've opted to publish this video. I'll let you tell me in the comments how this worked out. In order to test the comparative effectiveness of the EFSWL, I need to stack it up against a common ham bands wire antenna. In my wire collection, I have a 40 through 10 meter off-center fed dipole. I've set it up as an inverted V with the apex at about 25 feet. I've got the EFSWL set up as a horizontal at 20 feet. A quick note on the EFSWL. There is a configuration option concerning the ground terminals on the matching unit. The default configuration is to short out ground pins 1 and 2, so I am going to leave that as is and not attach a ground wire. I've set up my Yesu FT897D on a picnic table along with an Alpha Delta antenna switch. I'm going to compare the performance of both antennas by tuning across the general coverage bands. Let's get started. My first test is on the AM broadcast band here in the medium waves. I'm on 1480 kilohertz listening to a broadcast station which isn't all that local. Hopefully this will give me a good reference point to test the effectiveness of each antenna. First, here is the off-center feds reading, just over 7 S units on the FTL meter. 
but take a look at the EFSWL. Much better. 10 dB over S9. That's quite a difference. Next up, the Canadian Time Signal Station, CHU, at 3.33 MHz. As you can see here, just over 7 S units gets registered on the off-center fed. This is how the EFSWL fared on the same frequency, registering CHU at just over 8 S units. That's a win for the EFSWL. Now CHU is fairly local to my location here in southern Ontario. You can drive to Ottawa where CHU is in about six hours. WWV on 5 MHz, a completely different story. Propagation to the west and to Colorado, certainly not very good. Not even registering a single S unit on 5 MHz, even though the WWV signal was audible, this being on the off-center fed. And guess what? The EFSWL also failed to deflect the S meter at all on 5 MHz, and in fact, the signal was not as audible on WWV on the EFSWL as it was on the off center fed. Let's give this one to the off center fed. As we continue our way up the HF bands, we come across an aeronautical weather station at 8764 kilocycles. Notice a plus 20 S meter deflection. Well done. Here's the aeronautical station on the EFSWL. Again, almost 20 over. I'm going to call this one a draw. Continuing our slide up the bands, we end up with a shortwave broadcaster at 9.810 megahertz. The off-center fed registering this station just over 9 S units. And take a look here. The EFSWL only pulling in the broadcaster at 8 S units. Up to 10 megahertz and WWV again. Here we can see just over 7 S units on the off-center fed. And now 10 megahertz WWV on the EFSWL. The meter deflection just under 7 S units. I'm going to call this one a draw. It's time for another international shortwave broadcaster, this time on 11.940 megahertz, registering 8 S units on the off-center fed dipole. Now the very same broadcaster on 11.940 on the EFSWL, an almost identical S meter deflection. This one's a draw. Up to 12.160, an international shortwave broadcaster pounding in at 9 S units on the off center fed. Now it's the EFSWL's turn, just under 8 S units. The win goes to the off center fed. Another broadcaster, this time. 13.827 megahertz on the off-center fed. You can see we're registering about eight and a half S units. Now to the EFSWL, same station, almost an identical S meter reading, tie. Here's a broadcaster on 15,770. Again, almost eight and a half S units on the off-center fed. The EFSWL clocks and almost identical 8.5 S units. It's time for the final comparison station. On 17, 775 megahertz, a broadcaster coming in just under 7 S units on the off-center fed. The same broadcaster, just over 8 S units on the EFSWL. Let's give this one to the EFSWL. Well, you've seen the results. My impression is that if you've got an antenna designed for the ham bands, you won't get much better performance by installing a secondary shortwave listening only antenna unless you are very interested in the medium wave frequency range. At that range, the EFSWL exhibited a clear advantage. Everywhere else, the off-center fed held its own and often delivered better results. 
Now some of that may very well be due to the 66 foot length of the OCF's radiator compared to the 45 foot wire on the EFSWL. I'd like to point out that I am not bashing the EFSWL. It performs very well for its size. I just don't think most hams need to bother with a receive only antenna like this if they've got a decent full sized 40 to 10 meter wire up already. On the topic of SWL antennas, if you are in the market for one that will allow for transmitting, albeit with a tuner, check out high-end company's SWL antenna. It features a 20 meter long radiator that can be used across the 160 to 10 meter range with a tuner. That's all for this time. As always, please leave your comments below. I read them all and respond to as many as I can. Now it's your turn. Get out of the shack. Get outdoors and get on the air. 73 from Tracy, VE3 TWM.